Good afternoon. Good evening to all those who have joined us today. I'm Pratibha Caleb, Senior Project Officer at ICLE South Asia and one of the coordinators for the Asia-led Partnership Secretariat. It is my imp immense pleasure to moderate this session today. Um, so we will be, uh, seagrass is the world's only flowering plant capable of living in seawater, an incredible ally to fighting against climate change. Globally, seagrass captures carbon up to 35% faster than the tropical rainforest. In carbon storage, Uh, this entire ecosystem. So this is a critical uh, discussion that we will be having today. And I am glad to welcome our speakers today and all of you for being for joining this critical discussion and taking this discussion forward. So thank you very much for joining in. I'll just go over, over the agenda for today. And of course, a little introduction about the Asia Let's Partnership for those who are new uh, to this network. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, again, like I said, uh, a short introduction on the Asia Let's Partnership, followed by two critical presentations by our esteemed panelists, um, Dr. Shea Hong Lee, who is the director for Pengu uh, Marine Biology Research Center, and then also Dr. Ling Xing He, who is the director of the Center for Environmental Restoration and Disaster Reduction at the National Shongxi University as well. This will be followed by a Q&A session and I encourage all of you to actively participate in this and pose your questions um, to the speakers today. And then of course we will uh, close the session with a few of the agenda points that we have and follow, follow up that we might have uh, as part of the Asia Lens Partnership. So thank you very much for joining in. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, it, was joint, it was launched in September 2012 and is a voluntary regional network that promotes local uh, low environment, uh, low emission development strategies in Asia. Uh, we have now been rebranded as the Global Climate Action Partnership and were formerly called the LEDS Global Partnership. And uh, we cover three regional platforms, the asia LEDS Partnership that we are par part of currently, the africa LEDS Partnership, as well as the... Uh, Um, hello, everyone. Um, myself, Anandan. Uh, I hope you are able to hear me. I think there is some internet connection and my colleague Pradibha is not able to uh, speak uh, or she's speaking, but uh, we are not able to listen. So I will uh, 
on behalf of her, I will continue the uh, presentation. Um, so uh, about the Asia Leads Partnership, uh, we are a voluntary regional network that promote uh, low emission development strategies in the Asia region. And uh, it was launched in 2011 and we operate, uh, the Global Secretariat operate through three regional platforms, Africa, Asia, and uh, um, Latin America and Caribbean. And um, the Asia Secretariat is hosted by ICLE Asia Regional Officers, and we are operating from New Delhi, India. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this is about the uh, partner membership. So we have uh, close to 1,300 members and uh, 65 government agencies are also part of the network uh, from 14 Asian countries. Uh, at Asia Leads Partnership, we uh, have a lot of uh, thematic communities of practice. Uh, we support countries in capacity building. We promote, also we develop knowledge products that are helpful for countries in the climate change uh, uh, topic. We provide a deep dive technical services, uh, technical support to countries on these uh, uh, key uh, thematic areas. We also organize several networking uh, capacity building activities. Uh, uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, these are the communities of practice that uh, um, we are managing uh, energy, finance, subnational integration, clean mobility, and building energy efficiency. On every uh, subject, we select uh, priority areas every year. And uh, this keeps uh, changing time to time based on the priority needs on a particular year. We organize uh, capacity building activities to cater to the needs of the members. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the quick uh, housekeeping rules for today. Uh, participants will be in mute mode uh, for most uh, um, uh, part of the session. And um, uh, you can send your question and questions at any point during the session using Q&A box. During open set discussion, uh, you will be allowed to speak to ask questions directly to the speakers. You can click the raise the hand icon so that we can unmute you. Um, also at the end of the session, we have a quick uh, feedback form using which you can send your feedback to us. Um, uh, Pradeepa, I hope uh, you're back. So maybe you could introduce the speakers. Yes, thank you so much, um, Anand. And yes, in the world of technology, sometimes it's not as reliable as we thought it was. But uh, thank you much, so much for co your cooperation. I would now like to uh, welcome Dr. Shea Hani um, for his presentation. Uh, Dr. Shea is a director as well as a research fellow at the Pengu Marine Biology Research. His expertise is in coral community ecology, artificial propagation of marine invertebrates, marine habitat restoration and EPA design and evaluation, and marine environmental education and community-based cooperation. Uh, Dr. Shea has over 20 years of experience in this sector, and we are delighted to have his um, experience and learnings uh, to be shared today with us. Over to you, Dr. Shea. Thanks, Pratiba. Uh, right now, I will share my screen. Okay. Can you pass the... Uh, okay. okay. I will share my screen with all of you. I'll change to the full yes, screen, can, it's okay. Yes, we can see it clearly now. Okay, thank you Pratiha. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am Xie Heng Yi, and you can call me Justin. I'm from Penhu Marine Biology Research Center, Fishery Research Institute, uh, Committee of Agriculture. Uh, it's, I am feel very happy and excited to have the chance to share what we have done in the past nine years about 
the restoration of seagrass bed. But to be honest, I am not an expert. <laughs> At most, I am a hard worker or lead a team and do some stupid things underwater. But fortunately, we have a real expert, the real master in uh, sea grass is the Dr. Lin Xin Zhu with us. And, you know, he just won a sustainability 2022, the carbon neutrality award in April. So I, I didn't have the chance to say congratulations to him. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> so I think with him with us to be the convener, we will have a very fruitful meeting today. Okay, so right now I will invite all of you to join me to review some general knowledge of seagrass. Yes, just like uh, the Protea said, uh, seagrass is the uh, mm, real vascular plant in the water. He had the real, the true roots stand and, and the flower. Uh, it, of course, it can flower uh, with the pollination. It can be fruiting. Even it can produce seeds. Its seeds look quite similar to the rice we eat. So some Japanese scientists, they are uh, trying to modify, the, the, incorporate the gene from rice into the seagrass. As of course, they are dreaming someday they can harvest the rice in the sea to cup with the, uh, you know, the soil salination of the rising sea water level. Uh, together with the other two kinds of substrate formed by the marine organisms, just like coral reefs, uh, mangrove forests, and seagrass bed, they compose the three typical coastal, coastal ecosystem in the ocean of our planet. Although the seagrass bed only represents only 0.3% of the total area, but in fact, it possess a very important ecological function for us. For example, it's a very important shelter or say the nursing ground for the marine organisms during his whole life history or part of their life history. So we can always discover or observe a lot of juveniles or larvae of all kinds of marine organisms within the seagrass bed. So it's the, the ecological function is very important. Of course, recently, the global warming or global change, or say the carbon emission become a very popular issue uh, worldwide. Scientists always looking for some potential candidates can absorb the carbon dioxide for the human being. So in the past, we always thinking to looking for those plants uh, on land. We see uh, several terrestrial uh, plants like uh, coniferous forests, tropical rainforest, etc. But according to the latest references, uh, some specific seagrass species, for example, the Posidonia oceanica, maybe will have a higher the carbon uh, re reservoir abilities than the other candidates. Uh, especially in their biomass or especially in their soil uh, of the organic carbon. They can, they can conserve more of that. They can then conserve more of the carbon in the soil beneath their, their plant mass. Of course, like uh, many, many other countries will do, um, Taiwan, we also have a very ambitious goal need to be achieved by 2050. It's the net zero carbon emission. So our government, they established 12 key strategies for several departments of our government. So the number nine 
the carbon sinks, uh, this mission belongs to the Committee of Agriculture. So the colleagues of the Committee of Agriculture, we are always try to ask help from the superheroes like uh, in the sea, like uh, together with the seaweed, the salt marsh, and the mangroves and the sea grasses. We call them as the blue carbon, means they can uh, effectively absorb or say to store the carbon dioxide in the sea. So we finish this little tiny puzzles of our committee of agriculture and together with the other um, teams or groups we will finish the whole picture to do something, help the planet and to save the earth, to save the organisms, of course, to save the uh, human being ourselves before it become worse. Okay, so Dr. Lin Xing Zhu leads their team to finish the, and uh, publish a very, very important reference uh, in Taiwan. They survey, study several locations about the Taiwan to make the species list of how many species of seagrass they can form the seagrass beds and how large or say the area of the seagrass beds in different locations. Uh, I say this is very important because it's the fundamental or say the baseline information for us to calculate how many new carbon sinks we produce in the future. So from now on, we will do some restoration in Penhu. Okay, the new seagrass beds will count it into the new, say, carbon sinks in the future for Taiwan, whether we can finish the net zero mission by 2050. The Dr. Lin's reference is a very important. So uh, I just please focus on this area, the Penhu is over here. So the Zhenhai, we have a largest area of seagrass bed in 2019. The area is about the 25.3 hectare. And so mm, the area in Penhu uh, is accounting for about 70% of seagrass bed area in Taiwan. We are the second place if compared to the Dongsha archipelago or say the protest archipelagos, uh, atoll, sorry, uh, uh, protest atoll. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Lin Xinzhu will tell you more about the protest later on. Okay, I think the lives in underwater is quite harsh things very, very beginning. In 1880s, about one fourth of the seagrass distribution has been lost. Uh, in the uh, 1940s, the seagrass is disappearing at the rate of 1% per year, but in 1990s, uh, increased seven folds. So it's about the 70% annually. And right now, the seagrass beds are disappearing at the rate of one football field every 30 minutes. It's an information from the UNEP. So it's a, it's a tragedy, but you know, for maybe for different countries, for different locations, the reason for the loss of the seagrass bed is various. Uh, for example, in Penhu, uh, you can notice the photo in the upper left, uh, some traditional fishing methods will result in the loss of the seagrass beds. The fishermen use the, use the hole. They dig the substrate directly. They, they are trying to find the clams in the substrate. Yes, after that, they, they collect the clams by themselves, but all of the uh, seagrass 
uh, the stand or rhizomes are just or leaves are just flow to the surface and wash away by the current. So it, it's a main reason in the intertidal zone in Penhu accounted for the loss of the seagrass bed. Of course, the other reason is maybe due to to prevent the ship grounding. You know, the, a lot of islands in Penhu archipelagos they need the boat for the transportation. So the dredging and the channel, channeling are quite frequent. So the dredging and channeling will cause the large area of loss of seagrass beds. Yeah, this is why the area in Penhu, uh, the, the total area decreased so drastically in the past 20 years. Okay, so we go back to Zhenhai. You remember the, the the, the, the largest uh, um, area of Penhu is the largest uh, area of seagrass bed here. In the past, they, we had record recorded, um, used to be have uh, more than 100 hectare area in total in Zhenghai one, Zhenghai Bay. So the seagrass, they densely populated all around intertidal and subtidal area in Zhenhai. In 2020, uh, our group to do the latest survey, only one third of the of the substrate was was um, inhabited by the uh, seagrass. Uh, so you can also notice some um, area labeled with green color. Those area was heavily buried by the soil and mud. So during the low tide, during the ebbing tide, those substrate will, will be exposed to the air. So this area is not suitable for the restoration for the uh, seagrass bed before it can remove artificially. Okay, so since 2014, uh, our team, our groups, they try to develop some very simple and cheap ways to help the seagrass bed to recover underwater. So you can see the divers and uh, put on the scuba gears, we borrowed some and densely, densely populated seagrass plants at the nearby seagrass beds and use our bare hand to plant each colony one by one. And we also use the iron frame down the water to make sure the proper density we use to, for the restoration. And we also to um, use the um, iron wire and uh, the plastic threads we can easily purchase in the hardware store to make this kind of piling anchors or say the, the fixed clips. Then every time we bury each colony of the seagrass, we use this kind of wire or say the clips to help them fix um, into the soil okay. until the roots of the rhizome grows up and it can fix them firmly to the substrate. Then we will go back to the water to remove this kind of clips, uh, retrieve them all. We will not leave them in the sea. Okay, so maybe after um, several days, we go back to the water to check whether those planted, newly transplanted seagrass are still okay underwater. So according to this figure, uh, the darker blue means the intertidal area. After eight days, you can notice most of them were detached, were lost. But only during the subtidal zone, only 30 to 40% of them 
or stay where they are, but most of them are gone. So the possible reason for the loss may be due to the rhizome of the root system have not yet fully developed. And the second reason it may be due to the mechanical or biological disturbances. So we will improve these techniques. Now, first of all, we, according to the mechanical, we try to enhance the ability to fix to the ground. So we choose the, the colony with more branches. Now, you can see from the left figure, left cartoon, with more branches means more roots because its roots is go out from the branches. So if we use those colonies with more branches, maybe they will have more roots after transplantation. So the results show, yes, with uh, those um, colonies with more planting unit means more branches, they have higher retention rate, means the only 26% um, were detached. And most of them, and more than 74% of the, the plants will stay where they are. Of course, when we go into the water, we will see a lot of herbivores, fishes will come here to graze those newly planted, newly transplanted seagrasses. And at the same time, the herbivore fishes, just like the, the rabbit fish, they will pull those seagrass out of the soil. So maybe some of these seagrasses were detached due to the biological disturbances. So we do another treatment. And after burial of the rhizome, we use the scissors to cut off the old leaves directly. So after three days, the new leaves will grow from the rhizome. It means also the roots also grew, from, also grow from the rhizome to the ground. It can help the seagrass attach to the ground more firmly to the substrate. Okay, so we use this quite simple way to do a lot of seagrass restoration all around a pen who mainly in the inner sea, uh, those area used to be used to have the seagrass beds according to the previous survey. So in the first five years, we see we, 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 we are very happy. We, we found they are almost increased eight times in the first five years since 2014. But even better, until last year, I, we, we thought, we, we found those seagrass were expanded more than 38 times if compared to the beginning. Even you can notice, you can find the seagrass bed from the Google Earth. Okay, so in addition to the carbon sink function, uh, this, those photos were taken uh, around the seagrass bed underwater in Penhu. You can notice a lot of vertebrates, uh, crustacea, mollusks, they hiding beneath, be, between those seagrass. Uh, especially I have to tell you, those seagrass, we, we use the hollow jewel union nervous as the candidates because the, this species with the higher a longer leaf length, so they can provide a better shelter shelter effect. And in the past, we also will do some releasing of artificially produced larvae, for example, the swimming crab. But in the past, we just release them randomly. And when we go down to the water, we can see the predators. The, the fishes coming in just join the buffet party to eat what they can eat. So they will cause a very high mortality when we just re release them to the sea. So after that, we choose the seagrass bed as the better place 
to release those artificially produced larvae. And you can notice those swimming crab are finding the leaves as the accommodation, even like a, a cafeteria, they can hide, they can eat the copy port or amphipod beneath the leaves. So it's a, also an ideal place for those juvenile of swimming crab. Okay, I, th I just think my time is up. So I have to stop here and thank you for your patience. I will leave it the time to Dr. Lin Xinzhu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heng Li, for giving an overview of the seagrass ecosystem and the different causes um, of uh, deterioration and the different seagrass uh, transplantation techniques that have been adopted for uh, re restoration. Um, it's reassuring to know that your efforts have resulted in significant increase in the sea grass beds. So thank you so much for your efforts. Um, and great, I think we'll have a number of questions, uh, but due to the paucity of time, I think we can um, go on to the next presentation. And I would request our participants also to share your questions in the Q&A box uh, while the next speaker uh, presents as well. Um, so the next speaker is, of course, uh, Dr. Link, who is the director of the Center for Environmental Restoration and Disaster Reduction at the National Shengdu University, Chinese Taipei. He's also the associate editor for the UNEP International Science uh, Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a regional assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services for Asia and the Pacific. He's also the lead author for the IUCN Mangrove Specialist Group. Um, his field of experience uh, lies in blue carbon, ecosystem ecology, wetland ecology, and marine ecology. And he has won many distinguished awards in his career. The last one, of course, being the Sustainability 2022 Carbon Neutrality Award. It is our pleasure to have you with us, uh, Dr. Lin, and we look forward to hearing from you on the carbon sequestration of the seagrass meadows and the benefit it has. So thank you so much uh, for joining. Over to you, Dr. Lin. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'll try to move my yes, slide. I think uh, you'll be able to now uh, move the slides. I think we've given you the remote control uh okay yes. yeah i yeah. can do it okay um i think the wonderful uh introduction and the, the presentation by the director xie uh he talked about the uh the restoration technique uh in chinese taipei uh, why we uh the, to want to restore the seagrass and here i uh, just uh supplementary to his talk uh i want to talk about uh, how much cover we have in Chinese Taipei and for the Seagrass Bay. And okay, so uh, I think the director here just mentioned the, the blue carbon, the significance of blue carbon and uh, compared to the green carbon as the forest, I think we know uh, so little about the blue carbon, but uh, the potential of blue carbon is great because uh, as you can see here, I'm sorry, there's some slide that you can see, but uh, the basic concept is that the, for the uh, blue carbon, the uh, carbon stock is uh, uh, several uh, times of forest. And so uh, the, it's the uh, 20 and 21, the science uh, editorial uh, comment that says the blue carbon can wait. So that's why we uh, need to uh, to estimate how much carbon we have in blue carbon. And uh, today's topic is the seagrass bait. And uh, we have uh, uh, many diverse uh, coastal ecosystem in Chinese Taipei, as you can see here, uh, we have mangroves, we have uh, so much, we have the seagrass bait. And, uh, but uh, one of the 12 key uh, strategy for our net zero uh, by uh, 2050, uh, is the natural carbon sink. And uh, from these three category, the first one is the uh, forest, the second is soya, and the third is the ocean, the blue carbon. And the uh, blue carbon uh, by 
2030, our uh, goal is we need to uh, store, we, we need to uh, sequester uh, 340,000 tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent per year. So uh, I think that's a, 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 a tough a task. Um, so uh, it, we uh, start to uh, uh, survey the, uh, how much area of the blue carbon uh, in Chinese Taipei. And uh, you can see the dot here, the different uh, dot uh, means the, the uh, different uh, system. And the blue is the biggest one is the seagrass bay. The secret space uh, in Taiwan is the largest area of blue carbon. Uh, and uh, the, how much we have, uh, as you can see here, uh, total, we have uh, 5,456 hectare um, in Taiwan. And uh, in Dongshan, uh, later I will talk about is uh, 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 more, uh, about the 90% of the seagrass space is in Dongshan and the other 10% is in the Penghu, the data she just mentioned. And the, for the, uh, the island of Taiwan, and the mangroves is largest at about uh, 681 hectares. So as you can see here, the seagrass bay is the largest uh, uh, blue carbon area um, in Taiwan. And uh, uh, I think the Dr. Xie just uh, 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 introduced uh, uh, what is the seagrass. And it, uh, the most important thing is it is not the seaweed. And uh, uh, in Taiwan, the, the seagrass is the, the diversity is very rich because one of the season, uh, one of the reason is because uh, the location of the, the Chinese Taipei uh, is close to the center of the seagrass species distribution center. And uh, in the world, it's about the 66 species of seagrass. But in Taiwan, uh, we have the 12 species. And this is the distribution of the seagrass bed in the island. And as, as you can see here, it's at least 18 uh, location, we have the seagrass bed. And um, most of the uh, location is in the Western uh, coast of Taiwan. And, um, and we also have the area of the seagrass bed. So uh, we, now we have the very uh, clear uh, data set for the distribution of seagrass bay uh, in the Taiwan. And uh, uh, this is the uh, seagrass species distribution um, in Taiwan. And uh, as you can see here, there are three uh, uh, distribution uh, center, or we can say it's a seagrass hotspot. One is in Southern Taiwan, and the other is in the Penghu, the Dr. Xie just mentioned. The third one and the largest one is in the Dongsa in the South China Sea. And this is the 12 secret species uh, in the uh, Chinese Taipei. And uh, we have the, some is the colonizing species and some is the persistent species. And also we have some uh, species is uh, between, we call it the opportunistic uh, uh, species. And uh, they belong to three uh, secret families, uh, the Zosteracea, and hydro uh, charitasia and the simotoasia. And uh, um, in, uh, in the South China Sea and the Taiping Island, uh, we have some uh, seagrass bay, but not much, it's uh, only 25 hectares. But in Dongsa, we have 5,400 hectares. So in Dongsa, um, uh, is a, we can call it a seagrass diverse hotspot. And it is also a critical uh, carbon sink because uh, there have uh, uh, the nine species and the total, the seagrass area is about um, 4,000, uh, sorry, 5,420 uh, hectares. And there, uh, the uh, seagrass species is a nine, is a, a about 14% uh, of the global seagrass species. And this is the uh, seagrass bay, the photo of seagrass bay in Dongsa. It's a very large intake and highly diverse. And so in the past 10 uh, years, we have tried to quantify the carbon budget of the seagrass bay is for to estimate the carbon sink. So, so uh, for each uh, major uh, seagrass species, 
we uh, uh, quantify the leaf um, uh, or the below ground production. And then we also quantify how much they can uh, the, uh, eat by the, the herbivore and also how much they explore. And we uh, minus the herbivory and the export. The finally, we will know uh, how much the, uh, the, the carbon of the seagrass, uh, or we call it the refractory material, can be stored in the sediments. So uh, based on this uh, flow chart, and we can estimate uh, the, uh, the carbon budget for each uh, seagrass bay in Dongsha or in the, uh, the uh, southern Taiwan. And uh, as you can see from this uh, plot, you can uh, know the uh, there's a, only a small uh, proportion of the below ground production or deep production is about two or four uh, percent. They can be stored uh, in the sediments. So this is the carbon sink. And in the past uh, two years, we start to uh, measure the greenhouse gas emission from the seagrass bay, especially in the intertidal seagrass bay. But the uh, the, much, the, the uh, greenhouse gas emission is not much. So finally, uh, we can uh, 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 establish the uh, carbon budget of the seagrass bay for uh, the uh, those hydra, uh, um, for the uh, Celestia hemprichia and also for the Helodio uninervus. And later in the future, we will try to uh, establish the carbon budget for uh, other uh, major uh, seagrass species. So based on this data, we can now uh, estimate uh, how much uh, carbon uh, can be uh, uh, absorbed and stored in the seagrass bay. And uh, as you can see from this table, the middle one is the, uh, the, the carbon uh, sequestration rate for the seagrass. The upper one is for the so much, and the, the below one is the mangroves. So from this uh, table, you can see the, uh, the carbon sequestration rate is about comparable to the so much, but uh, less about uh, one third or fourth, one fourth uh, of the mangroves uh, sequestration rate. So uh, based on these uh, uh, data, uh, we can further uh, estimate the, how much carbon it can store uh, in the, uh, the Taiwan, uh, uh, the Seagrass Bay. And uh, the total area for the so much is about one, uh, in Taiwan is about 188. And for the intertidal Seagrass Bay is 11 um, hectare. But for the subtitle zone, most of them uh, is distributed in the uh, uh, Dongsha Island is a uh, four uh, thousand uh, sorry five thousand four hundred and forty five and hacker and uh, uh, for the mangroves is six hundred and eighty one hacker and that uh, we uh, multiply with the uh, carbon uh, sequestration rate and we can uh, know that in total uh, we have uh, uh, three hundred and forty eight uh, thousand uh, tons. Um, of secret uh, carbon dioxide equivalent per year, we can absorb by the uh, blue carbon system uh, in Taiwan. And the uh, uh, seagrass bay can contribute about 87% uh, of the carbon. So uh, it's a, a huge, and also it's the major uh, the, the contributor uh, to the, uh, the blue carbon system in Taiwan. So that's why uh, the Dr. Xie they, uh, need to uh, develop the restoration technique to restore more the seagrass bay. And uh, also the Dr. Xie mentioned uh, the, uh, the seagrass bay or other uh, blue carbon system, they can offer and uh, provide many uh, ecosystem service so the carbon sequestration is just one of the regulating uh, service. And the most important is the biodiversity because without uh, biodiversity, they won't have the carbon sequestration. And so uh, we, if we uh, to protect the seagrass bay, then we can protect biodiversity also as well and the carbon sink. So this is the, the picture is the biodiversity of seagrass bay in Dongsha Island. As you can see, there's the, the uh, biodiversity is rich. And also 
uh, the most important is the seagrass. They are the food source of large marine animals. For example, green turtle, dugan, and also some shark. They also eat the, the, the uh, seagrass. So uh, in Dongsa, we also, uh, based on the, our uh, sampling and uh, the data from the uh, seagrass bed uh, uh, carbon, and also the biodiversity, we can control the uh, trophic model of the food web of Dongsa seagrass bay. And from this model, you can see the, the, the total uh, carbon stored in the fish or the other invertebrate, they can uh, contribute about one third of the, the carbon of the uh, stored uh, in the seagrasses. So uh, I, I think that United Nations they also urge uh, nature, uh, uh, the nature-based uh, uh, solution. So if we can uh, uh, protect or the restore or conserve the seagrass bed, it's a multi-win strategy because uh, we can have the carbon sink. We also can have the biodiversity and many other uh, ecosystem service. And for example, uh, the, they, these uh, blue carbon system, they also are nature-based defenses because when the, the, the wave, they uh, pro propagate from the sea to the land, they uh, pass by the seagrass or the mangroves, they can uh, decrease, uh, decline uh, their energy. And also uh, in Taiwan, uh, southern, uh, southern Taiwan, uh, we study the sediment, uh, sediment uh, thickening uh, by the seagrass bay. And uh, in other words, it's the carbon accumulation in the intertidal, uh, the seagrass bay. And we found that the accumulation rate uh, is higher than the uh, uh, sea level rise. So uh, it means uh, the, uh, the function of the seagrass bay can mitigate the threat of uh, sea level rise. So uh, in uh, many uh, other countries, they also uh, uh, they, they, uh, try uh, urge to restore the seagrass in uh, the abandoned uh, soil band. So in uh, Chinese Taipei, we have uh, 4,460 hectares and uh, the, the uh, abandoned soil band. So that might be a, a wonderful uh, place to restore uh, seagrass. So that's why uh, the Dr. Shea's uh, the restoration tax is very important uh, for Taiwan to increase or enhance our carbon sink in the seagrass bait. So uh, I think this is another uh, case uh, is that because the effect of laying a uh, power cable uh, on the sediment, it can uh, uh, disrupt the, uh, destroy the sun uh, seagrass bait. So restoration of seagrass bait in this area might be also important um, to uh, restore the carbon sink. And uh, in Dongsa, uh, in the past uh, few years, we also lost for some reason uh, the some secret space, it can estimate about 30%. So uh, restoration will be the very important uh, task uh, for uh, to restore or in, uh, increase uh, the carbon sink of secret space. And, uh, and also there are some low utilization uh, fishing ports uh, is an ideal place because it's a shelter place and it's very good for the seagrass uh, to grow. So uh, now well, we uh, try to investigate and, uh, the low utilization fishing ports. Uh, uh, so how many uh, they are suitable for the rehabilita uh, rehabilitation of the seagrass bait. Uh, and most of the, the uh, fishing ports is in Penghu. So uh, again, the uh, seagrass restoration technique is very important uh, for uh, this uh, uh, carbon sink uh, enhancement. Um, this is my talk, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. Uh, this is a wonderful presentation, and thank you for um, insight, uh, giving us the insights on how much um, of the importance of seagrass sec carbon segregation can provide us. And it's tremendous to know that 87% 
um, of the carbon segregation can be uh, from the seagrass species itself and the biodiversity of the seagrass species. So thank you so much. Um, we can now open the session for further questions from our participants. And if you would like to directly ask the speakers, you may raise your hands and we will unmute you so you can directly ask. Um, there are, of course, a few questions in the Q&A box as well. So maybe we can begin with those uh, while the other speak, uh, participants um, think of their questions. But I think we do have one uh, participant who would like to speak, uh, Mr. Speed Liu. Would you like to ask uh, the question? Um, if my colleagues can maybe unmute him. So are you yeah are you able to speak? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Ah yes, and um, I'd like to ask one question. And um, Taiwan's government has spent efforts to develop offshore wind facilities and uh, LNG terminal. However, those development will bring some destruction to our sea environment, especially the seagrass bed. And um, could you share with us? Is there any protection to offset those damage during the process of building these energy facilities? Thank you. So, uh, hmm. so maybe I will answer this question first, then maybe Dr. Lin will, okay. will, will help me to respond because um, maybe in Penhu, we don't have the offshore wind farm right now, uh, even the the natural gas station. So as far as I know, if the seagrass beds was degraded or, or disturbed um, within a very shallow area, maybe the intertidal zone to the depths up to uh, six meters. Yes, maybe we can try to use some, some techniques or simple methods to help them to recover. But if we eat at the deeper place, maybe there were, there were no sea grass bed over there. So I don't know whether do you have, and Mr. Liu, do you have any um, photos or evidence to tell, to let us know, is it already make some damages, cause some damages to the sea grass beds already? Uh, I just received some information from our newspaper. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I, maybe I can try to answer the, these questions. Uh, uh, I think the 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 depths uh, is uh, very different, and for the offshore uh, farm, uh, they uh, they usually uh, the the set up in the deep water. For example, there's a more than 40 meter, 50 meter. But for the seagrass bay, uh, they only uh, distributed uh, very near shore, uh, within 10 meter depths. So uh, I think that the distribution is uh, very different. And also, I think that the, the uh, one uh, possible uh, impact might be the, the power line. When the power line from the offshore farm uh, they need to go into the, uh, the land. So they may across some shallow area and the shallow area might have some impact on the seagrass bay, if the, uh, especially the intertidal zone. So at that time, um, yeah, yeah we, we, they, have, they may have some impact. So I think the, the, the seagrass restoration technique will be very important uh, to uh, restore the seagrass bay. And, and uh, I see in Taiwan, uh, the, the most possible uh, uh, the places in the Zhanghua, uh, in the middle Taiwan and the Zhanghua, because there's a more uh, uh, dense, the offshore farms. So you can expect there's many uh, power lines. They, they will lay on the, 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 the sediment and cross the, the, the sediment and cross the intertidal zone. Uh, so if we want to, uh, to mitigate or to enhance the 
uh, carbon sink of seagrass bay, we can consider and to restore some uh, seagrass over there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, um, everybody. Yeah, that was a very pertinent question and something that was also on our minds. We last um, session actually with the, we also had one on offshore wind. So I think uh, the linkage is quite critical um, when we look at expanding in terms of advancing our renewable energy sources as well as conservation and preservation of our ecosystem. So that was a very pertinent question. Thank you, Mr. Speed. Um, if there are okay. any other further questions, um, this participant would like to ask directly, you may. However, there are a few in the Q&A box also. So maybe I can start with that. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ritika Fernandez asked that uh, she's, she would like to hear about the nursery setups, for the seagrass restoration work, and also what the impacts of climate change have been so far on the seagrass restoration as well. Mr. Shea, would you like to take that? Okay, I will answer the first question to about the nursery sets up for the seagrass restoration work, right? Uh, recently, we just cooperate with the local communities uh, because we, we know we can spend a lot of money, we can spend a lot of labor to, to do the uh, seagrass bed restoration. But most important, we need the cooperation from the local people. It means when the seagrass sets up, we, we need someone to patrol to, to, to see whether there are any disturbances from the human, human beings. After that, when the grass grows up, and they maybe the local people will ask, would Will, will the Fishery Research Institute will help to release some fish fries or swimming crab or shrimps or clams, snails, something like this. Okay, we treat it as the nursery ground, but the local people think it's the income or direct income of the economic income. But for us, it's okay because all the resources we develop just want to benefit for all of the people, including local communities. So we are happy to have them to cooperate with us in Penhu. So this is the way we did in Penhu, try to set up those nursery ground for, for, the, for the marine organisms right now, right here. Thank you. This is the first question, right? So any, yes. yeah, maybe Dr. Ling will respond <laughs> for the first, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, I'll try to answer the second question. It's about the impact of climate change uh, mm -hmm. on your work. Your work, I think, is the doctor, uh, the director C's work, uh, mm -hmm. restoration, is there? But, but I, I will say about that. And uh, I think the, uh, the climate change you might have on the seagrass, uh, one is the sea, la sea level rise, and the other is the uh, warming. And uh, acidification, uh, I think, is a benefit to the seagrass because uh, for the seagrass, uh, the ocean as uh, acidification, uh, they can uh, absorb more carbon dioxide from the water. So you can grow, the seagrass usually can grow better. So uh, I, I, but I think the, the uh, global warming might have some impact, and but uh, uh, we have different species of the uh, seagrass. So uh, if, uh, for example, temperate uh, the the seagrass, uh, if they can uh, cannot uh, uh, survive well uh, between the uh, the global warming, maybe we can try to replace with the, some uh, tropical seagrass to uh, restore. And also uh, for the, the, the some uh, uh, sea level rise and uh, some uh, seagrass species, they can grow deeper and uh, some seagrass, they can grow uh, shallower. So uh, in a nature uh, environment, uh, in natural condition, they will adapt because when the sea level rise, then the, 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 the deeper uh, seagrass, they will move 
to uh, the shallow area. So we need to have some buffer zone to leave some buffer zone in the coastal zone. For these seagrass, they can uh, move automatically. So uh, they, they were uh, no sust uh, sustainable uh, there. If, if we, we block some artificial uh, barrier uh, on the coast, then they don't have the space for them or don't have the room, uh, the space for the, the seagrass to move and then uh, it will cause the, the seagrass decline. But uh, so if we can uh, leave some buffer zone for the seagrass to move and on, uh, I think uh, uh, no, pro no problem for these seagrass to, to survive uh, under uh, the, the scenario or the, the, sea, the sea level rise. Okay. So Dr. Ling, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So Dr. Sorry. Ling mentioned uh, about the choosing, cho choosing the right species for, species. for the transplantation. Well, yeah. Yes. That because we are facing about the temperature rising at the near shore in Penhu. Yes, we, we noticed the sun over the place, those sea grass were fading, maybe according to the records of the seawater temperature. Yes, the water temperature is much higher than the average. So maybe Dr. Ling, remind me, I can choose different species. Maybe they can tolerate higher temperatures. Yes. Yeah, he, in his paper in 2019, we had four different species in Penhu. Maybe I can ask Dr. Ling, which one can tolerate higher temperature? Yeah, yes. this is a good idea. Yeah, I, I also think about uh, one response to uh, speed, speed Leo. Because last month I go to uh, go to the UK to see the offshore wind farm. Yeah, because Dr. Ling mentioned about the power cable will disturb the intertidal area, maybe. So in UK, they don't allow the corporation to apply those power cable at the well. It means it, the corporation will choose the, the shortest distance to save the money, but in UK, they will design in advance. All of the corporation, they need to use the, the very narrow area or say channel to apply their power cable only within this kind of area. They are not mm -hmm. allowed to do everywhere they want. So maybe they, okay. we, can, we can borrow this concept in Taiwan also. Okay, this is a response to Mr. Liu, speed Liu. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to add on to what you talked about, uh, spoke about the temperature rise. So as you know, like for coral reefs, it might be uh, till the temperature of 25 degrees. So what exactly is the ideal temperature um, that seagrass uh, flourishes and beyond which you, saw, uh, you said that there was fading? Mm. But for coral reef, uh, it tolerate the tolerate of the coral reef is much wider, maybe from the 18 Celsius yeah. to 31 Celsius oh, in wow. Penhu, uh, because it's based on their temperature history. If those corals they stay in a much warmer environment for a longer time, maybe they can tolerate much higher limits of the temperature variation. But I don't know whether it's the same case for the seagrass. Maybe Dr. Ling will tell us more about seagrass. Yeah, I think the 31 probably the the the, uh, the limits upper, but maybe can higher because the, in Australia I know there's some uh, temperature should be higher, should be mm -hmm. higher than 31. Yeah, yeah it depends so, on the history and the, their uh, uh, distribution of where. The, the the temperature record there. Mm -hmm. So in our near shore in the intertidal zone, yeah, just pretty and uh, pretty pretty bad the ask. Uh, in in the past, uh, our average is about 25, 20 else Celsius degree during the summertime. But right now, mm -hmm. maybe we can record more than the 30 Celsius degree. Mm -hmm. So the okay. extreme maybe past the 33 in the near shore is really crazy. Yeah, so maybe it's a cause of damages to the seagrass over here. 
I, I, I can't uh, add a, a more, one more thing. So it's about the, in the intertidal seagrass uh, in southern Taiwan, uh, in the summertime, they can uh, as high as the maybe 33 uh, degree of Celsius high. But uh, the, they can expose, expose to the air just maybe a, for a, uh, one hour, two hour. But uh, after, uh, if they have uh, some uh, seawater, they submerge the, the, the seagrass, then it's okay for the seagrass, they can survive. And so mm -hmm. I think the, we, we also need to uh, examine the, how much time they can expose to the air, not only the temperature. Yes. For especially for intertidal seagrasses. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, okay. We have a couple of more questions. Um, one of them is um, so for the seagrass tra transplantation that you have, do you apply automation or robots, or is it done manually? <laughs> manual. You mean the manual? Manually. manually? Is it done manually oh, by manually. hand? Yes, that by a robot. Yeah, from... underwater <laughs> robot. Yes, because uh, our headquarters or say the higher rank the committee of agriculture they ask us to increase more area in the coming coming years. So we are thinking if we only use the human used by bare hand to plant a seagrass one by one, maybe it's hard for us to reach the goal. So we are thinking to use the machine, just like the, the, the rice, they, they use the like a belt or carpet. We, we just raised the seagrass in the carpet that made the machine to, to do the cultivation for us underwater. But we are not the expert in the agriculture machine. machine. So we are thinking to ask for help from other field. So maybe, <laughs> Committee of Agriculture or from Zhongxin University, there are some experts to help us to develop this kind of robot to help uh, us in the committee. <laughs> Dr. Lin, do you know any superhero can uh, do it for us? <laughs> yeah, we, we can think about that, but uh, I have uh, one uh, suggestion for the director Xie. Why you don't want to use the seed for the okay. germination okay. to collect mm. the seed from mm. the field? And then spread the the spread seed uh, the to so. yeah. I think that might be uh, better or faster for the the growth of seagrass. Okay. What do you think? Okay, I will try because we are facing uh, difficulties in germination of the local species in in Penhu. Yes, maybe mm. I will after this meeting. I will um, add something magic. For, from you to help them to germination in the indoor environment. Mm. I, I do not know if is there any difficult to collect the seeds, uh, seagrass, the seeds of seagrass from the field? Is it difficult? Uh, quite few because the master thesis of our colleagues is focused on the, the sexual propagation way of the seagrass. So maybe yeah. I can check out her thesis. Okay. Yeah. To see where, where the possibility we can find the seeds. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So just a follow-up question on that. So what is what has been the success rate in terms of when you do transplantation? So what has been the success rate of their survival? Like if you is it hundred percent or you know that you know thirty percent is not going to survive? Mm. As for me, maybe in okay. my in my slides, the, uh, the uh, survival rate means when we go back to the sea, they still attached to the ground, right? So as time goes by, the uh, seagrass will expand themselves to a larger area. So if according to our latest information in 2022, the area expand 38 times, we, we cannot say, the, the survival rate is 3,800%. It's not, it, it, it's not the right way to say that. But we, we focus or say we are concentrate on the maybe at the very first day, first 10 days, whether those seagrass were successfully attached to the ground. Then we will successfully expand, have the chance to expand the seagrass. 
So I don't know how to define the survival rate or say the successful rate of the seagrass. If we according to the area, total area, yes, we, we, we are su quite successfully to expand. Yeah, thank you. There is a question from one of our participants, uh, again, who would like to ask directly. Uh, uh, Mr. Mukesh, would you like to um, ask your question? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, good afternoon, go everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're very, it's clear. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, Thank you, thank you, Dr. Justin, and thank you, uh, Dr. Lin, for your wonderful presentations. It was really informative, uh, a very interesting to hear firsthand uh, the great, the huge potential of seagrass in the fight against climate change. Uh, besides, you know, the economic benefits or enhancing like the security of local communities. So I was just uh, trying to know: uh, Has there been a an estimate of the cost of such restoration process, uh, like for example, per hectare of restorations of Zika, what would be the financial cost? So this is, I'm just trying to understand. Thank you. You you are mentioned about the cost, right? Mm. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, we have done a quotation for the Taiwan Power Company last year because we, we want to apply a project from the Thai Power Cooperation. So I, we give him a detailed list of how many divers, how many boats, rents, and the accessories, something like that. If you are interested, maybe I will give you the quotation in new Taiwan dollars. You can make the reference because it's maybe not the case in your country. And you, you, can, you can check just for your reference. Okay, so can I have your email after the meeting? Be okay sure. for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. I asked You're that question welcome. because it seems so promising in the fight against climate change. This could be a model for many other countries uh, in their own way if it is cost effective. Thank you. Yeah, but I want to add one more thing about this, the cost. And if uh, I think we uh, should uh, should not only focus on the carbon sink of the seagrass bay, because uh, if you uh, transform the, the carbon sink to the carbon credit, uh, I I don't think it uh, uh, can fit your. I think the cost cannot may not uh, uh, enough for the the earning from the the money. But uh, we should focus on maybe the biodiversity or other co-benefit. I, I think that, that that's more important <laughs> for the restoration of seagrass bay. Great point, Dr. Lin. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, and just one, I think uh, we have time for one last question. Um, so has such restoration act, um, activities happened in other parts of the world as well? Do you have any examples of other nations who have done this? Excuse me. The, about, yeah. about what? Uh, so these restoration activities, have they been uh, implemented in other countries as well? Mm. Are there any examples that you can share with us? In other countries, you mean the deterioration, the degradation of seagrass beds? Yes, yes. Okay, Dr. Lin, do you have any example of the From seagrass degradation of other country? Uh, degradation, <laughs> I think in Man. Penghu, is a, that's an <laughs> example. And also in the Xiaoliuqiu in Taiwan is a small island. And uh, I think the degradation of the uh, decline of the seagrass spray it's about more than 50%, oh. the, the gun. So uh, in Dongsha, uh, I, I just mentioned in my uh, presentation, uh, the, it's about uh, uh, 2,500 hectares, uh, they disappear uh, in the 2014. But now they are uh, slowly uh, appearing again, but uh, the, the very slowly. 
So I, I bet I, I think the in the other country, uh, the the cigarette space, uh, uh, this the disruption of cigarette space should be more serious than than ours in Taiwan. I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, just maybe uh, Dr. Lin and Dr. Uh, Justin, if you could just share a key point that you think that um, our participants should take away from this presentation today. Yeah, you can just share fine. in like a one minute. That's fine mm -hmm. for me. I would think we can cooperate him in hand to help the earth to recover. Yes, it's really great to know you all here. Thanks. Okay, and I, I just want to say the blue carbon can wait or the seagrass bay can wait. We need to uh, do inventory first and then we uh, need to, uh, to study uh, the, because the emission factor uh, is very different uh, from place to place. So uh, we need to have a local uh, emission factor and then uh, multiply with the activity uh, data, which means the uh, distribution of area um, for the seagrass bed, then we, we will know the, how much carbon we have. And then we, we, we can think where we should uh, restore or enhance the, 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 uh, the carbon sink of seagrass bay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, as we come to the close of this session, I think we've had a wonderful uh, session and we've gone back I and mean, we can go back uh, knowing more about the seagrass meadows as well as having the insightful information that you have shared with us. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lin and Dr. Shea. Um, I would also like to thank the Council for Agriculture Executive One. Um, who has given us this opportunity to collaborate and to um, learn from each other. So thank you so much. And especially I would like to thank, we can move on to the next slide as well. And uh, I would also like to thank Mr. Eugene Chen, who is the Director General for the Department of International Cooperation, Ministry of Economic Affairs, for his constant support and encouragement for the work that the Asia Less Partnership does. And of course, uh, Ms. Tra Tiffany Kwan, uh, without whose constant perseverance and active engagement, these sessions would definitely not be possible. So thank you all uh, for today's uh, session. I would also request um, everybody, uh, if you have further questions, please do reach out to the Asia Let's Partnership um, and we will direct the questions to the speakers. Uh, there's also a feedback uh, form that you would like us to fill that really helps us in uh, answering some of the uh, dis uh, issues that you might have and how we can further improve um, on these sessions that we have. And of course, the session is being recorded and uh, we hope to also share it with the larger community and it will be available on our YouTube channel as well at Asia Led uh, Partnership um, as a YouTube channel. And uh, finally, I would thank everybody for joining in, for sharing all their insights and for asking the quest right questions um, to the speakers today. So thank you everybody for joining in and have a wonderful day. Thank you everybody. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you.